everyone, Mr. Bonnie back here again with another biology lesson, this time on macromolecules, which are the materials that build cells. We're going to get started with looking a little bit at some of the chemistry behind macromolecules first. But first and foremost, what are our macromolecules? So here we have an image of a lipid, or fats, as they're more commonly referred to as. These are one of four macromolecules that you'll find in living things, and living things only. You won't find these in non-living things. Fats are really good for energy storage, and they're also used to compose the cell membranes of cells. Here's a carbohydrate, and this carbohydrate, as most carbohydrates, are used primarily as an energy source. They get burned as a fuel inside of cells, and then that fuel is turned into ATP, among other things, which powers the cells, all of the cells' functions. Here's a protein, and proteins are probably one of the most complex types of biological molecules. They take really intricate shapes, and proteins really do all of the actions of cells. Anything and everything that a cell needs accomplished will be done by a protein. And then finally, we have nucleic acids, which are kind of the information storage for all cells. Everything that a cell needs in terms of how it's made, how it operates, all of that is stored in DNA. And ultimately, what DNA does, it's a set of instructions to make proteins. So then DNA makes the proteins. Proteins then carry out all of the functions of the cell. So as I mentioned, in order for us to have a better understanding of these macromolecules, we need to know a little bit of chemistry first. Now, a lot of this chemistry is stuff that you've covered before, but let's go through a little bit of some chemistry basics. So over here on the right, I have an image of a carbon atom. And this carbon atom is part what makes up the carbon element. And elements combined together through chemical bonds make compounds, right? So we're talking about macromolecules. So how do we make those macromolecules? We need elements first. Elements are made of atoms. So in this atom here, we've got a couple features that we can see. The first is in the center, the nucleus, which is around this red ring here. The nucleus is composed of two major things, which are protons and neutrons. Protons, as spelled out here, are positively charged particles, and the neutrons have no charge. What's in key here is that the nucleus contains the vast majority of the mass, like almost all of the mass. There is electrons that are floating around in space outside of the nucleus, as is indicated here, but the, nucle the, the electrons are so unmassive that we don't even account for their mass when we talk about the mass of the atom. So some things to note about when we take a look at the location of the electrons is that they travel in orbits or in a space around the outside of the nucleus. Now this carbon atom specifically has, we can, if we count them, one, two, three, four, five, six electrons, and that's to balance out the six protons that are inside of the, the nucleus of the atom. Six protons, six electrons mean that this would be an atom of carbon that is neutral. So if we take a little bit, a little bit closer, more look at the electrons of an atom, we have an element here of sodium. Its chemical symbol is Na. Now sodium, as you can see in this picture, has 11 proton, or 11 electrons. If I count all of these spheres here, I'll note that there are 11 dots. And in the nucleus of sodium, there's also 11 protons. So what we see here is a neutral atom, one where the number of protons and the number of electrons are even. But if we look a little bit more about how these electrons are spaced out, we'll notice that this first ring here only has one, two electrons. That's because the first electron orbital, or electron shell as they're sometimes called, can only ever hold two electrons. Once there's two electrons in that first shell, it is filled. And then what will happen is we'll move to the next shell out. So the shells after that, for purposes of what we're going to look at in this class, these shells here can hold a maximum of eight electrons. So if I look at the second ring out and I count the electrons, I'll find that there are eight electrons total in this ring here. So if I take the two from the first ring and then the eight from the second ring, and I add those two together, I get two plus eight is ten. And I told you that there were 11 electrons total in a neutral atom of Sodium. That means that we're going to have one electron in this outermost level here. Now that outermost electron has a name. They're called valence electrons. Valence electrons are special because they're the ones that will actually get used in chemical bonds. What's important to note is that what all atoms want is they want their outermost shell of electrons to be filled. This is called the octet rule, which means that we want eight electrons in the outermost shell. Now, the outermost shell can be this first shell if we're talking about a smaller atom, like hydrogen or helium, for example, because they, hydrogen only has one proton, helium has two protons. So to balance out the charges of those, we need either one or two electrons. So hydrogen and helium will only ever fill this first level, but every other element 
will move to the second ring and then, and then after. So sodium really has a couple choices in what it can do. It can either gain seven electrons in this outer level, or it can lose one. So let's take a look at that in our next slide here. So here again is that same model of sodium with one valence electron. So sodium really, its choices are gain seven or lose one, and pretty clearly it sounds like it's going to be easier for sodium to lose one. And so that's what it will try to do to make it so that its outermost level then is the second level here, which would then be full. If this is lost, then the outermost level would be full. Let's take a look at another element, and this is chlorine. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. So if we take a look at all of the valence electrons of chlorine, we see that there are seven. So chlorine is in a similar situation where it can either then gain one or lose seven. Losing seven seems like a kind of a lot, so what chlorine would prefer to do is to, well, gain one. And so I think you can kind of see where this is going. This is the beginnings of how we form what's called an ionic chemical bond. A chemical bond is just simply when you have a reaction between two atoms that causes an attractive force, which makes them want to stay together with each other. The way that this works in this situation is shown on right here. This valence electron from sodium will actually pick up and move over to the chlorine atom. When that transfer of electrons happens, it creates some charged particles. So let's take a look at that. So here's another image showing sodium chloride, the end product of this ionic bond. Take a look at this sodium atom here. The one electron that was the valence electron has now shifted over and it's with the chlorine. So what happened here is here's our first two electrons in the first shell. Here's our next eight in that second shell. And notice how the electron that was in the outermost shell is now gone. So what's happened is that this sodium has lost one, of, one electron. Remember that electrons are negatively charged. So if you lose a negative charge, that makes you more positive, which is exactly what we see right here. Sodium now has a positive charge on it. And the amount of the positive charge will be related to how many electrons it loses. Since sodium just lost one, positive one charge. Now the one is not shown after the positive because if you just see a positive or just a negative sign, it's assumed that it's a positive one or a negative one uh, charge. Taking a look over here at chlorine now, what chlorine's done is chlorine has gained an electron. So in its outermost shell now, including the green ones plus the yellow one, now there are eight electrons. So both of these atoms are now happy. They have their outermost electrons filled. But now by gaining an electron, electrons are negatively charged. When you add a negative charge, you are now have a negative one charge on this atom. And so what we have here is we have one atom with a positive charge and one atom with a negative charge, and that creates an attractive force. This is just like magnetism, where you have two opposite poles of a magnet, a north side and a, and a south side. So what will happen here is an attractive force happens between this negative charge here and this positive charge here, and that creates the chemical bond. This right here, this line is indicating that these two atoms are now essentially stuck to each other because of the electrostatic uh, attraction between the positive and negative charge. This is an ionic bond. The ions is a positive charged sodium and a negatively charged chlorine atom, hence the, the term ionic bond because it's an interaction of ions. The other type of chemical bond that we can talk about are covalent bonds. So I brought up again that atom of carbon. Carbon is brought up in this case because carbon is most often to form covalent bonds. And let's take a look again at why. Again, we have six protons in the, in the nucleus of carbon, so that means a neutral atom of carbon will have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. Now, if you're looking at this outermost shell and you're looking at it and say, well, we've got four electrons here, so to get this filled, carbon would either have to gain four electrons or lose four electrons. It doesn't seem like there's an advantage to one of those versus the other. So carbon doesn't do either. It doesn't gain nor lose. What it does is carbon will then end up sharing electrons instead of gaining and losing them. So let's take a look at another atom as well. This is hydrogen. Hydrogen just has one proton and then one electron. Now remember, hydrogen will only fill this first energy level for its electron orbital. So it really either only needs to gain one electron or lose one electron. Same type of situation is going to happen with hydrogen most often. It's not going to gain or lose, it's going to share. So let's take a look at a very common compound which uses just carbon and hydrogen. This is methane, which I want you to take note of. We're just showing the outer ring here 
of this carbon atom. Then we're not, the, there was a, an electron ring that was inside, but we're just not showing it. The blue electrons were the outermost valence electrons for carbon. Notice how there's four of them. And then notice how each hydrogen atom contributes one of its electrons. That means that the electrons will spend some time around carbon and then also some time around hydrogen. Think of this as almost like a Venn diagram. In the places where they're crossing over, that's a location of where the electrons are shared back and forth. So what will happen is that for a period of time, carbon will have eight electrons around it, making it happy. But then each hydrogen atom will have two electrons around it, also making it happy. This sharing of electrons back and forth between the atoms creates an attractive force, which is what we call a covalent bond. And so again, because the carbon has its eight electrons around it, it's happy. And because each hydrogen atom has two electrons around it, it is also happy. The reason why we go through some of these, chemist uh, these chemistry processes here to start off before we talk start talking about macromolecules is to see what these macromolecules are actually look like and what they're made of. So again, you maybe you've heard this term before that living things are organic life forms or they're carbon-based life forms. So take a look at this ca uh, carbohydrate that's displayed over here. This is the chemical symbol for uh, ribose. It's a very common five-carbon sugar. Notice that there's carbon bonded to carbon and carbon bonded to oxygen and carbon bonded to hydrogen. These are all covalent bonds that are heavily dependent upon the chemical bonding of carbon. And notice that carbon will very often bond to itself. So understanding how chemistry works, specifically with covalent bonding, is really important for living things. Take a look at this other organic compound. These are types of fats, saturated and unsaturated fats. And notice the long chain of carbon bonding here. And another long chain of carbon bonding here. Each individual dash is what's called a single bond. And in a single bond, two electrons are shared. One back and two electrons move back and forth between each atom. Take a look at this one right here, this with two lines. This is called a double bond. So in this case here, you would actually have four electrons being shared back and forth. Here's another type of macromolecule, or at least the, the predecessor to a macromolecule. This is an amino acid. Amino acids are used to make up proteins, which is one of our one of our four macromolecules. And notice again how we've got carbon bonded to carbon and oxygen and hydrogen, and in this case we add in nitrogen as well. But what's important to note is that chemistry is super important to understand when we take a look at these macromolecules in order for us to understand how they function, it's important for us to know a bit of their chemistry first.